I'm ready. Okay. 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 Hey, what's up, you guys? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what's up, you guys? Yes. Welcome back to my channel. Um, this is our show. Say, Say what? what? And it's just like a pod talk. Mm -hmm. Talk show, podcast, whatever you want to call it. We're two best friends. I'm Sydney. Lauren. Also known as Sis and Assassin. And we just sit and tell each other things to try to like blow yeah. the other person's mind. And they can be spooky and they can be creepy. They can be mysterious. They could be conspiracy based. They can be all the things. Leave no stone unturned. Exactly. So this is episode three. And what we have done is we started with basically getting to know us. You can go back and watch or listen to that and just get a level set of where we both are. We're pretty similar in terms of viewpoint on the supernatural, weird, crazy stuff. Yeah. So I think I, I think that's everything. Did I not say everything? Yeah. Okay. If yeah. I forgot something, sorry. Subscribe. That's a, we'll, we'll, we'll be here. That's a thing that people do. So here Stop. we go. All right. So today I have a couple of stories, one like longer one and two shorter ones um, for Lauren because I could not decide <laughs> on what to talk about. I don't know how these people do this yeah. once a week because <laughs> some people do this once a week. So I'm going to start with what I think is the bigger story and it is the story of the murder of Teresita Basa. Okay. This woman was an immigrant from the Philippines and she was found murdered in her Chicago apartment in 1977. Apparently, the ghost of Teresita helped catch her murderer. Sure. Yep. So like a, a ghost, like the movie ghost kind of situation. Yes. Yeah. But real life. Yeah. Unfortunately, her murder went unsolved for quite a while. She was killed in 1977. There were no motives, no leads. Five months after her murder, that's when someone stepped forward and was like, check this shit out. And the person who stepped forward was named, oh, I'm sorry, the person who stepped forward helped put the, the killer behind bars. A coworker of Teresita's was tried and convicted. His name, Alan Showery, Showery. Teresita was born in the Philippines in 1929, and she came to the U.S. in the 1960s, as many immigrants did, for a better life. Initially, she studied music, and then she ultimately became a respiratory therapist, and she worked at Edgewater Hospital, which was located just outside of Chicago. It was said that Teresita was quiet, like pretty much kept to herself. She was pursuing a master's in music, and would actually give piano lessons to children in the neighborhood. She had a husband, Joe, who she just like pretty much, they just were living their lives. When she wasn't working or studying, she, they were just chilling out, they were hanging out. On February 21st, 1977, someone named Ruth, I guess a friend of Teresita's, called Teresita and they chatted for about half an hour and Ruth would later testify that Teresita was expecting a friend to come over, but didn't give any additional details about who the friend was or the purpose of the visit. An hour after Ruth spoke to Teresita, the fire department was called to Teresita's apartment after neighbors complained of smelling smoke in the area. Firefighters ultimately discovered trigger warning, okay? Um, f firefighters ultimately discovered Teresita naked and buried under her mattress with a knife protruding from her chest. Uh, investigators ultimately determined that despite the appearances, she wasn't sexually assaulted. There was no physical evidence at all leading to a murderer. So nothing like that had been found. Just like a very extreme display, but no... Buried under her mattress. Yeah. Rough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Yep. Because there was no physical evidence to help locate someone, unfortunately her, her case kind of like sat cold for almost half a year, so about five months. Um, they had no leads, they had no information. And then six months, half a year later, Dr. Jose C. Chua Jr., who was a co-worker of Teresita's, claimed his wife 
was having visions about Teresita's murder. And I am going to try right now to pronounce her full name, but then I'm going to call her a nickname for sure. Okay. <laughs> her name, the wife, the doctor's wife's name was Remy Bias. Remy Bias. I'm going to call her Remy. So Remy was having visions about Teresita's murder. So Dr. Chua claimed his wife was in a trance, and in the trance she said, Doctor, I would like to ask for your help. The man who murdered me is still at large. Ooh. Ooh, chills. Yes. When he pressed his wife further about the identity, he said, I was really surprised and scared when I asked her her name, and she answered, Ako Yi, I am Teresita Basa. She told me I had nothing to be scared of. She was really pleading for me to help solve her murder. So this is Remy, like, spiritually speaking through Teresita, or Teresita speaking through Remy to her co-worker. Did they know it? they were co-workers? So the doctor was a co-worker of Teresita's. Right, yeah. Okay. And his wife was having these visions. Teresita's ghost pointed the finger at Alan Showery, Show I think it's Showery, a respiratory therapist who was also a co-worker of Teresita's. And though Showery, Showery, whatever, he's a murderer, Fucking Alan. initially tried to get the case against him thrown out because all the evidence came from the great beyond, Police testified that Allen went quietly when, uh, with investi investigators when he was first suspected in the murder. He was acknowledging his guilt. He didn't complain about it when they arrested him. He was like, yeah, okay, this checks out. I'm expecting to be questioned by the police, yeah. basically. After an initial mistrial, trial, Allen ultimately decided to plead guilty to the crime on February 23rd, 1979, and he was only sentenced to 14 years in prison, not gonna lie, like, and he was also let out on parole, um, less than a decade later. But that's, like, some brutal kind of murder. Oh, I agree. I a thousand percent agree. And I don't know, it doesn't exactly say... Yeah, so I think basically the, uh, the argument was that he confessed. He was given his rights and he confessed to the murder after the fact. So they were trying to throw out the trial based off the fact that it was a fake tip from the beyond, yeah. essentially. But he did confess to it. Obviously he didn't serve nearly enough time for what he did. Just confessing to it doesn't sh shouldn't have brought his conviction down to only that amount though considering he got away with it for like six months before they had any kind of leads it's because he ple pleaded guilty yeah that's the reason it was so short at the time and also like kind to his point like there's nothing in these articles that say that he that there was evidence besides them just being like that guy. Doctor wife get possessed by the dead person right. and tells the doctor that it's that guy and then they arrest that guy. Yeah, and I mean he didn't like to be fair, he didn't have to come he no, didn't have no, to confess. Absolutely not. So they really didn't have a case against him. He just was like, Alright, yeah, I did that. Um, but I mean, if if you'd murdered someone and then you found out that that someone has possessed put someone else in a trance and given your name I'd be all up confessing that shit to I'm like yeah I, I've fucked with you enough I ain't letting you <laughs> fuck with me in the afterlife I did it I'm sorry shit yeah. please don't haunt me <laughs> yeah that's fair I would agree with that I'd be like oh you calling me up by name <laughs> all right go on. I'll accept this let's move on you rest in peace yeah so that's um <laughs> That's her story, and she's sticking to it. That's wild. Yeah, I thought you would enjoy that. That is wild, especially yeah. considering they didn't really have much of a case against him apart from the fact that she said, yeah. So this is going to be very super short, but I found it, and I was like, you just need to hear about it. Okay. Okay. On February 25th, 1884, Mrs. Kit Lassiter, who was noted for truthfulness, it says this okay. in quotations, was walking near her home in the New Hope Township of Chatham County 
which is um, North Carolina. She was walking when she heard what she thought was a hard rainfall. Shocker, we've all right. experienced that. Yep. Glancing up, she saw only clear sky, but when she glanced down, she saw what appeared to be the aftermath of a shower of pure blood. Ew. Mm -hmm. No thanks. None of the liquid had fallen on her, but it had drenched the ground and surrounded trees for some 60 feet. Some accounts say yards, which is very different, but regardless, there is some circumference around her. Not just a spot in front yeah. of her that is like, yeah. Upon hearing her story, neighbors rushed to see for themselves and when later interviewed, confirmed the story as it was related to her. Um, samples were collected and were sent to a professor at UNC at, for evaluation and by mid-April he addressed the topic in every test every test performed except one the conclusion was the same that the samples were blood <laughs> he had no explanation this is dr. FP Venable he had no explanation beyond the result of the fact that this was blood um, he's just the the subject is quite a puzzle and offers a tempting field for the theorist blessed with a vivid imagination. Similar cases of blood showers have been reported for centuries in various locations around the world. Shut the fuck up. Blood showers. Mm hmm No. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. How you like them apples? That's it. That's all there is. That, but I saw it. I saw it and I was like, this is the weirdest thing is, no. I've ever heard of. Can you imagine? Where did it come from? I don't know, but it says that the sky was clear, but yeah, then it was just blood. I don't know. Apart from a short period of heavy downpour of Yep. And they blood. they do have like they, there was this was published in the journal of the Alicia Mitchell Scientific Society and they did they did like write a paper. He did write a paper about this. The professor who did all the the samples, like he for sure, if you look it up, it is in um <laughs> it is printed. It is a scientific document. I'm like looking I I don't I I'll post a little this is what it looks like. It's real. Somebody actually with a doctor in their title, a doctorate degree, blood showers are they? <laughs> Basically is what they decided. My, my, my other question is, did they test whether it was human blood or not? No. I don't know the differences between, like, blood from species to species, so I can't really say on that, but it doesn't look like... I would say, honestly, the way it's described, a part of me wants to think that it was, like, human blood. Yeah. Just because of, like, how it's described and talked about. And he's even saying in his journal or whatever, it was saying that he did say it even had the smell of fresh blood. So, uh, no. I would say they're probably human, comparing it to human. So, yeah, that's that. Well, my ears are very glad to have heard about that story. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, you were just like, well, I'm sorry, what'd you just say <laughs> to me? What? The last story that I have, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw this and I was just like, how? Like, I have so many questions. None of them are <laughs> answered through this, me talking about this. Um, but I still have question, questions. I'm, I'm not going to give any context because it will a thousand percent give it away. I'm just going to okay. go straight into the okay. story. Okay, go on. I'm ready. Okay. On the night of December 20th, 1980... 19-year-old Jean Hilliard's car hit a ditch. She tried to walk for help and was found in the morning in front in the front yard of a local cattle cattle rancher and she was frozen. Solid. And like this was a huge thing when this happened. It was covered on TV. It was told on Unsolved Mysteries. I don't know if you heard yeah, that yeah, you know yeah. that show. Yeah, yeah. This story has been a very very big deal. For decades since this happened she woke up she thought she thought Ex I'm sorry what she thought she's alive Jean is alive because she thought 
I had gone into town and met some friends, she said in a recent, recent interview. I headed home about midnight. She took a shortcut on an icy gravel road just south of Langby. Her dad's Ford LTD had rear wheel drive and no anti-lock brakes. It slid into a ditch. She knew someone down the road, so she started walking. And it was 20 below that night, which is cold. Cold. Be cold. And she was only wearing cowboy boots, so this is like extra cold. I'd get over one hill thinking his place would be there and it wasn't. She said, I was more frustrated than anything. When you are that cold, your body is shutting down yeah. that whole time. Yeah. So that whole time, she got through, I'm impressed she made it two miles. She got to her friend's house and everything went black. She had, people told her later on, she made it to her friend's yard, tripped and crawled, was crawling to get to his doorstep. And then that's where she was frozen. So she was frozen there for six hours. She was so close. She was really close. It says that she was laying there with her eyes wide open, frozen. And she doesn't remember any of it. Her friend, the person whose house she was going to, he, he said that he had been out with her that night. Jean was dating his friend. So they had all been out that night. And he brought a girl home and did what adults do. Yep. And then they woke up in the morning and Jean was frozen on his uh, front porch. And that's, you know, really romantic way to end your evening. <laughs> um, but he said when he found her, he was, thought she was dead. She was really, really stiffed, but she, he saw like air bubbles coming out of her nose. So somehow she was still like taking in air which is incredible and he got she couldn't get her into his truck so he had to they had to use his date's car <laughs> to bring this frozen girl to the hospital and he said it was like a very awkward way to end the <laughs> evening they had yeah. when she got to the hospital they did not have high hopes for her as one would not nope. they couldn't get an IV into her arm they kept breaking needles so they were like okay so she was mostly dead, but they were like, let's warm up her body with heating, heating pads. And by mid morning, she woke up. She was like spasming, but she woke up by noon. She was coherent. She was completely normal. She right. went back to like normal Full life. Recovery. She like was sitting there in the hospital having thought from being a living ice cube. And she was like 19. She was a kid when this was happening. She started worrying about her dad finding out that his car was in a ditch. Like, she fr came uh, alive again, and that was her concern. Yeah. And she was completely fine. And then the University of Minnesota, a professor there, a professor of emergency medicine, says this kind of thing happens occasionally. He's an expert at reviving people with extreme hypothermia. There's not a lot of data, but he said he's handled about a dozen similar cases over the past 10 years. As a person cools down, their blood flows, their blood flow slows down, and their body requires less oxygen. It's almost like a form of hibernation. If their blood flow increases at the same time as their body warms up, they can recover. We have patients you can knock on like wood. They feel rock solid, frozen. That doesn't dissuade us from resuscitating. We have a track record, so that's. Professor of Emergency Medicine David Plummer, who apparently just thaws frozen people. Um, <laughs> His specialty. Yeah, apparently. The strange part of Jean's case, he said, is where she made her recovery. These days, doctors use a special device that pumps the patient's blood through a heater, warming their organs yeah, 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 yeah. from the inside. And all they had at the hospital, because she was in rural nowhere they literally only had heating pads that's it that's all they had and they also considered they almost amputated her legs as well but all she went home with was some toes that were like numb for a bit now she's lived a, like a normal life completely normal nothing has happened she was married has children like all this yeah. kind of stuff has not had any lingering health issues she she also says she doesn't spend too much time thinking about it she just like she just bundles up now, no more cowboy boots. And I will post a picture here because there is a picture of her from the hospital. This is her. Looking absolutely fine. Looking absolutely and fine. And that's the story of Jean. 
I, I don't know how I was saying her last name, Hillard, Hilliard, I think it's Hillard, waking up from apparently being a snow cone. Someone kick Elsa out, we found the tree frozen. Queen. I know, seriously. I always, I was thinking about it because obviously I had a couple of stories that I knew I wanted to talk about today and that was one of them because I saw it and I was like, I have never heard no. of anything like no. that before, especially because when we see animated things or like movies where someone is frozen yeah. it's like they are frozen but then like there are times you know for theatrical effects where like the thing that was frozen comes back to life yeah and okay. it's such a weird thing to me because I didn't even know that that was a possibility that you could be frozen for six hours that is such a long time yeah. And she wasn't even receiving medical intervention during those six mm -hmm. hours. She was out on a porch through the night, overnight, for six hours. Because obviously her body was shutting frozen. down, yeah. getting to that point. Because it was like... She was walking yeah. for miles in the mm -hmm. freezing cold. Nope. Yeah. Nope. So, really a fascinating weird thing don't think i'm ever going to complain about being cold again yeah, yeah i know isn't that weird yeah because i've experienced some like my toes going numb from yeah. where i grew up from snow and stuff but never nothing ever that extreme no go <laughs> heating pads get yourself one today everybody needs one <laughs> so what do you think what's yeah, the moral that, of the story here um stay warm if stay you warm. Um, drive your car into a ditch, probably stay in your car and call for help rather than getting out of your car in sub-zero temperatures. Well, this was 1980. True. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wait. Yeah. Wait for technology to advance. <laughs> <laughs> Sit in your car and wait. Yeah. <laughs> yep. This is, uh, definitely is one of those. I have seen numerous stories of people accidentally getting locked out of their cars or like dying because they were just trying to do something yeah. similar um, and they just like could not make it. It's a very extreme thing for your body to go through. So the fact that she survived is incredible. All the stories today were like really funky. Yeah. Um, the, the which is why I, which is why I picked them all. I just was like, <laughs> let me just be as weird as possible right now. Let's not focus on one thing. Let's find really a couple of weird things that I've never heard of. And I've never heard of like any of those things. So. Yep, yeah, you did say you were gonna blow my mind and my mind is successfully blown. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hopefully your mind is blown too. If you have any ideas of stories or theories or mysteries or whatever that you are interested in us talking about definitely let us know in the comments below and I hope you enjoyed these very weird these were really weird <laughs> sorry I got a little weird with this one out there to yeah what we typically see oh yeah. yeah oh yeah baby and we will hopefully see you in the next one yeah in the next one bye bye sick sick Creepy ass blood showering. <laughs> <laughs>